Hello, everyone. Hi there, my name is Abigail McCoy. I'm a 2009 senior management major. Welcome to today's lecture, put on in partnership with the Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship at Georgia Tech and Women Advancing Microfinance. Our live webcasting partner is Impact Media Solutions, and our media partner is 90.1 WABE NPR Radio. In today's growing global economy, the world of microfinance is vitally important to helping the world's poor have access to proper banking and financing opportunities. Through loan programs, people in the poorest areas of the world are able to take a small loan, as little as $20, and turn it into the capital they need to start a business, feed their families, and free themselves from poverty. Our guest today is Mrs. Deborah Burand, Director of the International Transactions Clinic at the University of Michigan. The International Transactions Clinic specializes in helping law students gain practical experience within international financial trade. Through the clinic, students are able to gain work experience and the skills necessary to negotiate, conduct business, and be socially responsible in today's global economy. Mrs. Burand is one of the trailblazers in microfinance, despite having been in the industry a very short amount of time. She has served in many positions, most recently as Executive Vice President at Grameen Bank, the world leader in microfinance. She is also the co-founder and president of Women Advancing Microfinance. She's held senior positions within the U.S. Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve Board. And before going into government, Mrs. Buran served as an attorney for Sherman and Sterling, working with international law and banking. Mrs. Brand is a graduate of DePaul University with a bachelor's in political science and also holds a joint master's degree in international business and law from Georgetown University. Please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Ms. Deborah Brand. I see a couple friends in the audience and I want to say hi to you all. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, uh, just a quick correction. I was the Executive Vice President of the Grameen Foundation, not the Grameen Bank, and that's important within the Grameen family. Um, the Grameen Foundation is based in Washington, D.C., and was set up to try to share with the rest of the world what was being done so successfully by the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. So I've never even been to Bangladesh, although I uh, had the opportunity to uh, take the learnings um, and inspiration of Dr. Yunus to other parts of the world. Um, I am delighted to be here, and I want to first uh, say something about one of our sponsors, uh, WAM, uh, Women Advancing Microfinance. This is a group that I helped start several years ago when we saw a defeminization going on in the leadership of microfinance, which seems a bit odd when you think about how many women are being served by microfinance to see that perhaps the leadership um, doesn't necessarily mirror the client base that we have. And so a group of us started saying, how are ways that we can build both the, the uh, quality and the skill base and profile the women who are doing so much so well in our industry so that they're not forgotten and they're given opportunities to continue to grow as leaders. And WAM has now oh, about 500 members around the world and there's a fabulous chapter here in Atlanta which I'm just delighted to see. And I understand that after this, um, up on the fourth floor we'll be having a WAM event. So for those who are wanting to participate in that, I encourage you to join us. First time I ever came to Atlanta, and I think the only other time I came to Atlanta, it was to get on a plane to go to Norway where I became a foreign exchange student. And I was from a small town in Indiana, a uh, so small town that I was carrying in my backpack a whole bunch of self-addressed um, postcards that my mother had painstakingly made out so that I would mail them back and let her know how my experience as a foreign exchange student was going in Norway. And because we were from a small town, my mother had thought, well, why don't we go ahead and put stamps on them too? So I carried with me American stamped postcards, which I then tried to mail from Norway. So I want to give you a sense of, uh, for those of you who may be much more worldly than I uh, was, um, some of us can jump a little farther in life and get these kind of experiences. For those who might have come from small town backgrounds too, um, there are ways to grow. And my mother no longer uh, sends uh, postcards with American stamps when she's outside of the country. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit first about 
what I know and what I've learned about microfinance. And I also want to change the title of this talk. And I'm changing it because I found this really interesting quote recently in The Economist that said, there is nothing like a crisis to make people wonder if what they're doing is necessarily the right thing. And I was thinking about this and how my watching of the subprime mortgage crisis has made me start thinking a little harder about how well we're doing in microfinance. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, you know, there's a lot microfinance can learn from what's happened in the subprime mortgage crisis, but there's something else going on. There's something that the subprime mortgage crisis could have learned from microfinance. So what I'm going to offer to you today are lessons that microfinance may take away from the mortgage crisis, but then I want to talk about something that microfinance could have taught and hopefully will now teach our banking community as we move out of this crisis. But let me start with a little bit of background. Um, I joined the microfinance sector uh, in January 2001. And I joined it at the encouragement of a woman who took me to lunch um, in October of 2000 and was telling me about microfinance. I have to admit, I didn't know much about it at that point. And she was explaining how these are small financial transactions aimed often at poor women and how these women take small loans and they invest in their families. They sometimes, if they're illiterate, they teach each other how to write so that they can sign their own names on their loan agreements. How as these women's businesses grow, they are sometimes able to not only provide better for their families, but then perhaps take better care of those in their communities that don't have families, such as orphans from HIV AIDS in Uganda. And as she was telling me these stories, um, I started crying, several times actually. And I, I thought, wow, I'm getting pretty emotional here. Well, she's a very good fundraiser. And fundraisers are good at getting those stories out. And at the end of the lunch, I thought, well, if I've been this dramatic, why don't I go the whole way? So I took all my credit cards out of my wallet. And I took my checkbook out of my wallet. And I put it on the table. And I said, whatever I have is yours. And this woman looked at me. She said, well, wait a minute. I just wanted your resume. <laughs> I said, what in the world could I do in microfinance? And she said, I don't know, but I think you're going to figure it out. And that's how I joined microfinance. So I must tell you, I'm not the best resource on telling you how to find a job in microfinance, because that doesn't happen very often to people. Um, but I came into the sector a pretty blank slate. I had some preconceptions, though, and I want to talk about those preconceptions because I found out that I had a lot of things wrong in my mind about what microfinance is. I thought microfinance was very small loans being uh, lent to very poor women in group gatherings, often under trees and villages, um, lent by do-good, not-for-profit organizations with money that they had received from donors. That's how I saw microfinance. The only word I really got right in that description is the word small. And even that is debated within our sector, meaning some people will say it's not microfinance if the loan is larger than $1,000. Others will say, well, in a particular economy, that might be very micro. So even the word small doesn't necessarily have a consensus. I was wrong in these ways. I didn't understand how diverse the product offerings are in microfinance. We don't only give loans. We also now are able, in some cases, to make deposit taking of, uh, facilities available. When you think about your own first banking relationship, how many of you, the first time you walked into a bank, it was to get a loan? How many of you walked into a bank for your first transaction, and it was to open a checking account or a savings account. Exactly. And that's what we started to realize in the microfinance sector, that deposit-taking services were as valued, and in some cases more valued by our clients, than our credit-making services. So we are seeing microfinance institutions now increasingly looking for ways to be able to offer savings products. We also see them doing remittances, doing micro leases, micro insurance. So a whole panoply of financial services are being made available to people. 
the other part where I didn't quite get it was this idea that we only serve women. Now, we primarily serve women. But you will find differences as you go around the world. And you will find populations where men also are serviced by microfinance. And for some people who've been doing research, they will tell you that actually you're making loans to households. That people are not so autonomous. And that, in fact, in some communities, it is the entire family that is making a decision about whether or not they need financial services. And they may send the mother, the daughter, to be the face. But in fact, it's a household who is making this decision to access these services. About the providers, I, I thought it was generally not-for-profit organizations. Well, there are wonderful not-for-profit organizations delivering financial services to the poor of this world. But increasingly, we're seeing other types of providers. We're seeing banks, non-bank financial institutions. We're seeing state banks. We see postal savings banks. We see a whole panoply of different kinds of legal form and different kinds of business models that are trying to find ways to get financial services to, to the poor. And we are as a result, not purely funded by donations anymore. And I'll speak a little bit more about how our funding sources have changed in recent years. But my biggest preconception that was really off the mark was that I looked at microfinance when I first entered this industry as purely a financial transaction. I want to step back for a moment. When you say the word credit, you're actually looking at a Latin word, the root of which is credere. And it means to believe. And what I had missed when I was looking at microcredit is that every time we made a loan to someone, we, in essence, were saying, we believe in you. And that's huge if you're someone who's been living at the base of the economic pyramid in the world today. There are not many people who believe in you and believe in your potential. I first started to understand this when I talked to a woman who worked in microfinance in Uganda. And she told me that she could tell how many loan cycles, meaning how many times a person had borrowed, a woman in this case, from microfinance institutions by how long she could sustain eye contact. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, a woman who's getting her very first loan will barely look at me. She'll stare at the ground the entire time. A woman who's now getting her second, third loan will be looking up and then looking away. By the time she's getting her fourth or fifth loan, she's staring me in the eye and saying, when are you lowering the interest rate? And this transformation in her sense of power was something that came out of that lending relationship that she was building with her microfinance institution. I also learned through my own eyes that microfinance has the power to say, not only do I believe in you, but I believe in the potential of your children. I learned this when I was in Tanzania. I was uh, working for a group called Finca at the time. And Finca is a Spanish word that means rural. So we did a lot of rural type microfinance. And I had been invited to come to a program that was just about to bring a whole new group of women into their program. And they decided to celebrate that these women were going to get their very first loans of their lives by having a party and bringing women who had already had several loans to the party too, so that the women could talk to each other about this experience. Because it's quite intimidating to take out a loan if you're only living on a dollar or two a day. That can be quite a scary thing to do. And they said, we're going to make this a celebration. So I was just standing on the sidelines observing the party when a woman who had had several loans from my organization approached me and asked to speak to me. Now, she was speaking in Swahili, and that's not a language I know. So I needed to have a translator. So this man said, oh, I, I can translate for you. So he came up, and he talked to her for a moment. And then he came over to me, and he said, she would like to thank you for her soft knees. 
Now, he had a very thick accent. And I wasn't sure I understood him correctly. I said, I'm sorry, what did you say? He said, she'd like to thank you. And then he pointed to his kneecap. She'd like to thank you for her soft knees. And I said, I have no idea what you're saying. So he went back and talked to her for another moment. And then he came back and he said, because of the loan your organization has given this woman, she has been able to grow her business. And as a result, she's taken the profits of that business, and she now pays for the school fees of her children and for their food, and she no longer needs to kneel in front of her husband to beg for money. That was the moment I became a secular missionary for microfinance. It dawned on me, finally, this is more than finance. This is changing the opportunities that women and their children have in the developing world. It's giving them protein that they may not have access to otherwise, and it's keeping their daughters in school. That's huge. And that's being done on the back of sometimes loans as small as $25 or $40. So what is the state of microfinance today? Estimates are that there are about um, 10,000 or so institutions in the world, in all those varying forms I was describing before, that are providing financial services to the poor. And as I said, they come in all shapes and sizes, from not-for-profit to for-profit. Using 2005 to 2007 data, our best guess is that there's about $25 billion worth of microcredit available in the world today. And that's reaching about 133 million to 190 million people. Now, that sounds like we're doing a really good job. But it's a very small fraction of what we're estimating the demand is for microcredit. The demand numbers are closer to 1 billion people wanting $275 billion worth of microfinance. So we are not even close to reaching the potential of this market. And so when you see or hear numbers like this, there's a natural tendency to say, wow, microfinance is a powerful tool and engine for change in people's lives. There's many, many more people who want, need, and can use microcredit to change their lives. Let's get it out as fast as we can. Let's pump up and get that and meet that unmet demand, or supply, excuse me, demand. And this is where I turn to the title of this, of this talk, which is I think that we need to step back for a moment and think about what's happened in the subprime mortgage crisis here in the United States before we jump to the conclusion that faster is better in microfinance. And there's four lessons that I think the subprime mortgage crisis can teach us today, those of us working in microfinance. And let me give you them very quickly, and then I'll go back and I'll try to explain a little bit more what I mean. One, access to credit is not always a good thing for communities. Two, how credit is used matters a lot. How credit is used matters a lot. Three, some people do not need more debt. Four, make only the loans that you would be happy to keep on your own books. Those are my four lessons that I think the subprime mortgage crisis could teach us. Let me step back for a moment. Lesson number one, this idea that access to credit does not always benefit the local communities and to which credit's been directed. I think we all have seen that as we look at what's happened in the subprime loan mortgage market. Access to credit should not come at the expense of quality of credit. Now, most people, when you're reading newspapers today, when they talk about the quality of subprime mortgages, they're actually talking only about one dimension of quality, which is how likely are the borrowers to repay that loan. And I think that is important, but I don't think it's the only point. Quality in a financial product, in a financial service, also needs to look at uh, is that product and that service improving the life of the customer who's receiving it? We've had enormous growth in the microfinance sector. Generally, 
a well-run microfinance institution can grow between 20 and 30 percent a year. That's very fast growth. But we have seen in most recent years some microfinance institutions growing by 50 percent a year. I would challenge our sector right now to think about whether a 50 percent growth rate is providing quality as well as quantity of credit. I'm not sure that we should be holding those institutions up as the darlings of our industry anymore. In fact, what we might want to do is to say, blinking yellow caution light. Let's look and see if they've been able to grow quickly with quality, or do they need to slow down a bit and make sure that the services that they're providing are not only pumping up their balance sheet, but improving the lives of those that are receiving that credit. I think we also need to look at the incentives that we're building into microfinance institutions to get that credit to the poor. We, like many other sectors, use bonuses and schemes to try to encourage those who are making decisions about giving credit to, a, to a borrowers to find ways to get more yeah. borrowers. And I think we need to slow down and again take a look at whether or not our compensation schemes are incenting behaviors that we're comfortable with. Very interesting quote I read today by a fellow law professor, Bill Black, who I had the opportunity to meet in January, who is an authority on, what I love this term, dysfunctional financial systems. And uh, Professor Black said, it is the compensation system, now he's talking about the subprime mortgage crisis, it is the compensation system that has proved to be the weak point in every thing critical that went wrong that produced this global catastrophe. And then if you've read Your Economist recently, you'll hear that in a poll that eFinancialCareers.com recently ran, 79% um, of the Wall Street workers that they surveyed received a bonus for 2008, and nearly 50% of those people were dissatisfied with the amount they got. Well, we don't give bonuses in microfinance like you do on Wall Street. But as I said, we do give bonuses. And I think we need to consider whether or not our compensation schemes make us at all vulnerable to the risk that we're incenting growth over quality. And we shouldn't be hiding behind the fact that our numbers are smaller to avoid a very long, hard look at how we are encouraging our staff and our senior management. And are we setting up schemes that align the interest of management and staff with the long-term interest and missions of microfinance institutions? And we should be ready and we should be getting this kind of scrutiny from all of our stakeholders. Lesson number two. There was an IMF working paper that came up out in September that noted that more than half of the subprime loans were used for refinancing existing mortgages rather than buying a home. And it went on to say the obvious, refinancing does not represent new access to credit. So this is where I came up with my lesson number two. How credit is used matters. If we're refinancing existing debt in the microfinance sector, then we haven't actually increased access to credit. And we do know that's happening. What we don't know is how much of that is happening. We know there are markets where microfinance institutions are competing for the same clients. We know that microfinance institutions are being paid off with loans that the clients have gotten from other institutions. We know that micro entrepreneurs at times are using microcredit to make payments for consumer financing debt that they have. And I think we all need to start paying and researching closer attention to, in fact, what is the use of the credit that we're giving? And are we truly increasing access to credit, or are we just substituting? Which means that we have to spend more time evaluating our clients' capacity to pay. Back to the prime, subprime mortgage market. For prime mortgage loans, now I'm talking about prime, not subprime. For prime mortgage loans in the United States, the standard mortgage debt to gross income ratio is 28%. In 2006, there's research that shows that in the subprime mortgage market, that 
ratio was 41%. We in the microfinance sector need to pay closer attention and develop a more rigorous and nuanced understanding of our clients' capacity to pay before we extend credit. And that means at least two things. It means that we need to understand who the real client is. Remember that point I made about is this a single individual borrowing from us or is this an entire household? And once you have a better sense of who the true borrower is, then you have a better sense of what you should be measuring. And then we need to understand better what their existing debt load is. We need to understand if they have payday loans. We need to understand if they have uh, supplier uh, trade credit. We need to understand if they have borrowed from lots of other microfinance institutions and are just trading payments from one to the other. We have not developed very much yet credit bureaus in our sector, but that seems to me to be one place that you might want to start in trying to understand the debt load of the people that you're working with. It's hard, and it's very hard in markets where it's hard to identify people, where you don't have an, a national ID system, where it's hard to know if this man who goes by Harry Brown is the same as this man who also goes by Harry Brown. But that doesn't get us off the hook from thinking about more rigorous ways to start analyzing the debt loads of our clients before we make more financing available. Let me get to my next uh, lesson, which is about credit risk transfer mechanisms. You know, we've heard a lot of negative things about securitizations and the securitization of the subprime loan market. And I will say, I don't think they're per se bad. But I do think we need to avoid excessive transfers, and you need to limit the moral hazard that is inherent in these credit transfers. And by that, I mean when you are originating a loan purely to distribute it to someone else, we need to find ways of building structures and transactions so that you are wanting the credit quality of that obligation to be as good as if you were to keep it on your own books. And what we saw in the subprime mortgage crisis is that actually credit quality went way down because people didn't feel that they were going to get stuck with it. Between subprime mortgage crisis, between 2001 and 2006, 60 to 80 percent of subprime loans were bundled into mortgage-backed securities and sold to investors in the capital markets. So we're talking about a huge amount that was going in this way, in this originate to distribute business model. Microfinance has also used securitizations. We've had two true sale securitizations of microcredit portfolios, one in Bangladesh and one um, in Bulgaria. But we've also had other forms of credit transfer risk. We have had sales of microcredit portfolios, sometimes sales of existing microcredit portfolios, sometimes forward sales. I will sell to you the microcredits I make tomorrow. We also have seen what we call the partner agency model, whereby a commercial bank funds a microfinance institution to be its agent, find micro entrepreneurs to make loans to. And they develop sort of the microfinance institution would be the front office and the bank would be the back office. Now, I think these credit transfer risk mechanisms can have a useful place in our industry, but I think we should be learning something from the subprime mortgage crisis, which is let's make sure that as we do this, we do not lower the quality of those microcredits. And we are as diligent about making sure that no matter what we plan to do with this portfolio, that we continue to deliver quality to the end user, our customer. And this brings me to my very, very last lesson which is the lesson that microfinance could have taught the subprime mortgage market and why I decided to rename this talk. Microfinance has a core set of values. Best practice microfinance really has a very different business model than what happened here in the United States with the subprime mortgage market. And so that lesson I would call is the stay true to the core values of good banking. And I have to tell you, this was not an original thought 
by me. In a recent online virtual conference that was sponsored in November, a representative of a microfinance network said this, and I think he was right on the mark. He said, let us hope that if nothing else, the global banking crisis has served as something of a wake-up call for the banking community regarding what a good banker's core values should be. And microfinance has long held as core values. Understand your risk, be transparent with your customers, and focus on long-term value rather than short-term profits. Our U.S. financial system is in a crisis of confidence right now. That credere, that trust, that I believe in you, you believe in me, has, has, has been lost. In late January, a financial trust index was launched by some professors at Kellogg School of Management and the University of Chicago. And in their index, they found that only 22% of Americans today have faith in our financial system. Well, the good news is, is microfinance is not experiencing a similar crisis of confidence. And while funding is slowing to our sector, we aren't seeing significant depositor runs. And we're actually seeing some sources of funding go up. Has anyone ever heard of Kiva or Microplace.com? These are online lending platforms where retail people like you can invest in microfinance. In the last quarter of 2008, both of those online lending platforms saw their numbers go up, not down. So what we have in microfinance is confidence and trust. And so the lessons that I've been sharing today is how do we maintain that confidence and that trust? And I think the bottom line is, is that we cannot just wrap ourselves in our do-good flags and say, boy, we're helping the people of this world. We're helping the woman in Tanzania that Deborah Buran met. We have to actually think of the systems and procedures and policies that we are putting in place so that we can maintain that trust and confidence, the trust and confidence of our clients and the trust and confidence of anybody who invests in us. So that's the end of my prepared remarks. I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you. Let me just start off with a question and then we'll open it up to the students. Could you explain a little bit more what WAM does? Are, are you a, like a lobbying group? Or, oh, no. <laughs> uh, how, how do you uh, actually advance sure. microfinance? Uh, what we, oh, are we advancing it? Is that the question? <laughs> how did you? Terrific. Um, WAM uh, is a group of uh, women professionals and some men. I have the first male uh, member of WAM sitting in the audience today with us. Um, who looked at what was going on in the sector and said, if you've got a primary female customer base, we need to be making sure that there are women in leadership positions. And so what we've been doing thus far is we've been helping to set up chapters all over the world so that women who are working in the sector and those who would like to support women working in the sector have a place to go where they can take their institutional hats off and be there as a network, a professional network. The other thing that we've started doing is we've had some forums where we're trying to raise awareness within the industry about the importance of female leadership Unfortunately, if you go to many microfinance conferences, you will often see them being dominated by only men speakers, which is a real shame because there's talented women, extraordinarily talented women in this, women in this industry. So we've been trying to showcase our expertise. Um, we also, and we're small, but we've also been able, with the help of various um, chapters and donors, we've been able to get women who otherwise wouldn't be sponsored by their organizations to conferences and trainings that they might not otherwise receive. So that's sort of where we've been so far. So you're growing like, the leadership. This, we're really focusing on growing the leadership and bringing awareness to the fact that uh, women are an important resource in our industry and they need to be valued and they need to be advanced. Yeah. yeah I'm I'm actually a student member of Women Advancing Microfinance. Ah, congratulations. Um, and it's been almost two years since I did an internship in microfinance in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree that uh, experience in microfinance re really puts in these values, especially ethical financing and uh, social entrepreneurship. 
but I know you, you said you're not the right person to ask, but do you see anything growing in terms of avenues for students and recent graduates to get involved in microfinance and get those experiences, either to affect you know, the large population that's left that can be helped by microfinance, or as we see now that can come into our economy and bring good ethical leadership? Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of the global networks that um, offer internships to students um, so that they can have a field experience. Um, you know, the challenge is making sure that the student is giving value add to the sponsoring organization. Um, and that's not to say it can't be done, but it isn't as easy at times as you might hope it would be. Um, I know my, one of my old organizations, Finca, has very effectively used students, undergraduate students actually, for some of their field research about what's going on in clients' lives. So what they do is they get a whole big group of students every summer and they send them into the field with one goal, which is to interview clients, the micro-entrepreneur, to find out how much meat they're eating, what their nutrient value is, what their homes are built of, how they're moving out of poverty or not, whether their children are getting jobs after they get uh, in uh, the schooling that the mothers have invested in. Um, that's been one, I think, extremely successful uh, program in using undergraduate talent and giving people an experience to see firsthand what's going on. Now, there's also microfinance going on domestically. And I was talking today at lunch. I know that there's microfinance going on in, the, in Georgia. Um, there might be opportunities in your own backyard to find a way to be a, a, a volunteer who adds real value. There's a way I'm Kenya, by the way. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, you actually started talking about what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. Um, about, which is namely, how do you see microfinance operating in developed countries, you know, um, marginalized populations mm -hmm. in the first world, because we always think about microfinance in developing countries. So what role do you see microfinance in empowering uh, economically marginalized people mm -hmm. here in the States or in Europe? Or? It is a longer answer than what I can do in this short time, so I'd, I'd be able and willing to take this offline with you. But um, microfinance is taking place in the United States with varying degrees of success. Um, one thing that we tend to see in microfinance when it's taking place in the United States is that the emphasis shifts from purely that of extending credit to also offering business and entrepreneurial skills. So there's a very heavy training component. Um, because that tends to be the block for a lot of these marginalized uh, individuals, not just access for, to credit. In fact, in our society, credit may have ha been too easy for some people to get. Having said that, there are still blocks of society where they can't get credit. And the places where I've seen that kind of microfinance focus in the United States tends to be recent immigrants, Native American Indians, populations that are somehow isolated from the U.S. financial system and are not getting credit card applications in the mail. Hi, I've got a question. Um, you mentioned Mr. Eunice's name in the beginning, mm -hmm. and he's won numerous awards for his contributions. I was just wondering uh, succinctly if you can just tell me why his microfinance program has been so successful in Bangladesh and possibly what you can draw in terms of inspiration from that program for here in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the reasons, I, there's lots of reasons why Dr. Yunus has been so celebrated in our industry. Um, I think one of the reasons is because he was such a pioneer. Um, microfinance has started in several places in the world, but Bangladesh is one of those several places. And Dr. Yunus um, was an economist professor, a, and he gave money out of his own pocket to several, I'm sorry, I, I want to make sure I see your face. <laughs> he, he took money out of his own pocket, um, sort of as an experiment, and gave it to several women um, who, were saying, who were telling him that they were getting all of their money from the money lender and how much they were paying. And, um, and the rate was so exorbitant that they were barely, barely making anything off of the baskets, I think, that they were creating as, as a result. And he said, well, we got to do better than this. So as an experiment, he gave some, a loan to them. And they repaid on time. And he started to say, wait a minute, maybe there's something here that's very important. And I think what Eunice has done so beautifully is that he has, and I'm going to quote from his Nobel 
uh, Peace Prize. And it was the Peace Prize, not the Economist. I mean, so that's, I think it's very interesting that he got it for the transformational aspects of his work. He was the one who sounded the wake-up call that poor people are no different than all of us here in this room. And the story he tells is he says, poor people are like bonsai trees. You can take a seed from the largest tree in the forest and put it, if you put it in a little pot, it will grow. And it will look like that big tree, but it'll never get bigger than this. And it's not the fault of the seed. It's the pot in which it landed. And he uses that analogy for people in poverty. And he recognized the potential they have to grow if given the right conditions. And I think that's what has made him such a compelling leader in our industry, his ability to shape that picture of who, what the face of poverty truly is and why it's so unnecessary in the world. My question is, like, um, how would you measure that qu credit quality of those individuals, like how you ended, how you landed in um, Tanzania or, or some mm -hmm. country like that, and like, how does that even compare? Like, there's, you said there's already securitization of uh, these microfinance um, packages that were traded in Bangladesh, in the two of them. How does that compare to? Um, the securitization of mortgage mortgages, mm -hmm. subprime mortgages in the U.S. and essentially and conceptually, they're pra practically the same idea. And what would be like the difference? Mm -hmm. uh, my point was is that I don't think securitizations per se are bad. Where I think they went wrong in the United States is that those who were so driven to get more subprime mortgages into the market quit paying attention to the quality of the mortgages they were making. That's not happened with the microcredit securitizations. The people who have created those portfolios to date made sure that those loans that they're securitizing are as valuable as the loans they're holding on their own books. But I think we could actually structure and engineer securitizations in our sector, in microfinance, so that that continues to be the case always. And one way, and I'm still thinking this through, but one way you could do that is by requiring any institution, microfinance institution, that decides to do a portfolio sale through a securitization or other type of form to always hold a little bit of risk against that sale so that they have a financial incentive to make sure that they're not just unloading bad loans, that they're continuing to give the same quality of loans that they're selling as they're holding on their own books. So that would be one way I would perhaps start re-engineering some of these uh, transfers. The quality issue, though, remember I said, is not just about how well you'll be repaid, which is how we, as a banker, that's what we mean when we talk about quality. Microfinance is starting to do very important research, and we've got some experts in this room who can speak more eloquently than I, about the quality of the lending experience for the end user and whether or not microcredit and access to financial services really is improving the lot of people's lives. And there's been some very interesting innovations in just the last several years to try to measure how fast do people move out of poverty when they get access to financial credit and whether or not that access to financial credit is an engine of that alleviation of poverty. I think we need a lot more focus on that quality of experience and that quality of what microcredit is than just the how well people are repaying. Hello. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. I saw on a, on a program not too long ago about microcredit, and it was talking of a company in Mexico that was making a lot of money off of um, very I'm poor Thomas, people. I bet. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is, are there any mechanisms, like international mechanisms, that could actually keep that from actually happening, turn it into more like a payday loan mm -hmm. type situation in which um, loan sharks will come in mm -hmm. in the front and they see this as a, mm -hmm. a means of making a lot of money off people? Um, 
I'm going to answer it in a broader way, um, but I'm happy to talk to you directly about Compartamos. Um, this was a Mexican microfinance institution that actually did a very successful initial public offering. Uh, so when I talked about the different forms microfinance organizations can take, this was a group that actually became a publicly registered company in Mexico. Um, there's many reasons why that was such, such a successful IPO. One of the reasons is because of the rates of interest that they charged, which some people in the industry feel were exorbitant. There are other reasons why that IPO was successful, though, that had nothing to do with microcredit and everything to do with what other types of companies were trading stock in the Mexican market at that point in time. So you had a market that was very, very liquid, that was looking for a place to make a good investment. So to some degree, the success of Compartamos was they were living in the right neighborhood at the right time. But that's not really what you're wanting to hear about. You're wanting to hear about the ethical lending practices of microfinance and whether interest rates should be regulated. If I'm, is that really what's underneath your question? Um, I am one of those who do not believe in formal regulation of interest rates. Um, I've seen countries like Ecuador who put an interest rate cap on and then found that, in fact, in order to make loans to poor people, you weren't making enough money to be financially sustainable. So people started loading up fees, not interest. And so they devised all these ways to get around the rule, which made the pricing of the product less transparent to the client, which it can't be what the government really was trying to do. And politically, once you put an interest rate cap on, it's very, very hard to be the parliamentarian or the politician who says, I'm going to let this interest rate, I'm going to take that cap off. I mean, you're politically dead at that point. So you sort of back yourself into a corner if you move in that direction. What I think is a better response to interest rate regulation is to require transparency and to make sure that everybody is aware of how much is being charged for a microcredit loan. And that includes the whole package, any embedded fees, how much is paid and when. And then to make sure that every stakeholder, the government, the investors, the donors, the clients, are seeing this. Because that's then when the market forces and the market discipline can start to work and to say, is this really appropriate? And if a client has choice, and in often markets in microfinance, they don't have choice. But in some markets, they do. And if they have choice, hopefully, they will go to where the cheaper financing is. And there'll be discipline imposed that way. There's been a wonderful movement in the last year in the microfinance sector in which the investors in microfinance, in part a response to the Compartamos deal, have said, we're going to pay more attention to the ethical lending practices of those institutions in which we invest. And so that's one place where stakeholders can really say, hey, I, I want to see what you're doing here. I want to understand if your marketing practices are appropriate, if your debt collection practices are appropriate, if your interest rates seem to be within the range that makes sense for the product that you're offering. So I think the more we can get market discipline to work, the less you have to depend upon interest rate regulation. Okay. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to know, if, do you face any difficulties in advancing microfinance in male-dominated societies? And if yes, how do you overcome such negative social customs? You know, um, it's interesting. Often in male-dominated societies, microfinance is the most needed because that, and I, I'm going to make a broad brush statement that has many exceptions, but in a male-dominated society, often what you're saying, that's code for women don't get access in the way men do. So those are societies where actually microfinance actually often can thrive. Now, there are challenges. Um, microfinance is starting to really take off in the Middle East right now, which often has a male-dominated society. We've had to adapt our business models to respond to that. Um, the key is whether or not, for microfinance to work, is whether or not women have an opportunity within their societies to run a business. And if they do, then our credit can help them thrive. But if they're not allowed out of their homes, if they're not allowed to conduct any kind of entrepreneurial activity, 
microfinance is not going to do a thing for them. So you need a baseline, and, and this is maybe even true of any society. People say, what's the one thing you need for microfinance to thrive? And my answer is a thriving micro-entrepreneurial class. If you don't tolerate microenterprise, we're, we're worthless on that. So that's, that's sort of my answer to this. You do have to be sensitive. I know that some of my um, Tunisian uh, friends who are running microfinance institutions decided that their um, empowerment of women uh, within their society might be so threatening to their husbands that it could endanger the women. So they started making sure before they gave loans to women that the women um, would come with husbands or brothers or fathers and there would be a whole conversation about what was going to happen to make sure that in fact they were in a supportive system so that the fact that they were taking a loan would not put them at peril. Uh, first, I just wanted to say that I do know of a domestic microfinance internship program that's a possibility here in oh, Georgia. Terrific. So if anybody's interested afterwards, you can just come see me. I'll, I'll hang around. Great resource. Uh, Thank you. And then my, my question was, uh, there's been a lot of talk also about the difference in lending uh, asset-based versus relationship-based mm -hmm. lending uh, for microfinance. I, did, I wanted to know, it wasn't one of your lessons, and had you thought about that? Yeah. Um, I have watched microfinance institutions um, uh, move from uh, character-based lending to asset-based lending, and I want to step back so that people understand what I'm talking about, okay, and then I'll, I'll get to your question. Um, one of the things that Dr. Yunus did and, uh, in Bangladesh and John Hatch did in Bolivia and others who uh, were at the very beginning of the microfinance movement is that they realized that often what has kept people from getting access to financial services is they have no collateral. So how do you get over that? Um, and so they thought, well, what if you made a loan to a group? So if I said to this group of students right here, the woman in the sweatshirt, the guy in the orange, all of you on that row, I'll make a loan to the four of you if you're comfortable with that because I'm going to come back and I'm going to expect to get it repaid and you may use part of it, you may use part of it, but you're all collectively going to vouch for each other. Well, you may decide that the guy in the orange shirt, I apologize for doing this to you, is a deadbeat and you really don't want to have him be in your group. You have now helped me make a character-based decision about who can get financing or not, but you know him better than I do. So we've used these group lending methodologies as a way to substitute for collateral, something people don't have when they're very, very poor. And that was an extremely effective way of getting microfinance out. So the question is, what do we think about microfinance institutions who say, okay, guy in the orange shirt, I know no one in your village likes you, but you do have a chicken and if you're willing to pledge your chicken and keep it alive, I might make a loan to you knowing that I can come get the chicken if you don't pay. Well, that's a very different relationship I've just made. I'm no longer relying on his character. I'm relying on the quality of that asset and the likelihood that that asset is there when it's time for me to be repaid. Some institutions have very successfully delivered asset-based microcredit. Um, others have really stumbled because it's such a different way of thinking about their relationship. Um, it requires understanding whether a chicken would be good collateral. I don't think it would be because it can run away. It can die. It could be stolen. Um, and so I've seen microfinance institutions who have moved into that area struggle. But here's the problem. Let's say that they all do like each other. An orange shirt guy, in fact, is part of the group. I wish I knew your name. I, I don't have to call you orange shirt man. <laughs> Patrick. Patrick. OK, so let's say we like Patrick. And Patrick has been borrowing with this group for a while. Patrick's at the point where he actually has developed a credit history with us. Patrick has paid back every loan. And he's now had 10 loans. And he's saying, you know, lady with the Georgia Tech sweatshirt, Amanda? Amanda, her business isn't growing like mine. I need a bigger loan. I feel like I'm being stuck in this little group. Please let me borrow by myself and give me a bigger loan. And so he wants to actually graduate 
from the group. So now, instead of being pushed out of the group, he wants to have an individual banking relationship with me, not a group banking. When that's happened, microfinance actually tends to work very well when it's graduating people out of the groups. It seems to. Where I've seen the institution struggle is when they just say, OK, we're going to do individual bank loans too. And they just start that program without having actually a transfer of existing clients into the program. I've got a question here. Uh, you mentioned there's a potential $250 billion that's what Deutsche potential. Bank thinks, the, that the market is there and there's a gap of funding there. Yeah. What, what innovations do you see in the raising of funds? And do you envision a day when maybe there's a mutual fund or a security that people can invest in that is a part of our portfolios that is a socially responsible I don't even imagine of? it. It's here. <laughs> I mean, there are uh, instruments that both institutional investors and retail investors can go into today and put into their portfolio. Um, there's the, uh, the way we talk about it is we talk about the asset class of microfinance. But your more deep question is we cannot get even close to that number off of donor dollars. So that preconception I had that this was all being done by not-for-profits only can get us so far. There's a reason why we're pushing into more and more for-profit models of microfinance because we need to access greater amounts of capital. And you cannot get to that point if you don't have any equity cushion. So you're going to see one of the innovations is more commercialized microfinance, which makes some of these subprime mortgage lessons even more important because there's going to be a profit incentive that's going to be pushing, pushing, pushing for quantity, not quality. So we need to, re we need to think ahead of this. We, we don't have the crisis now. Let's get in front of this train and make sure that we're thinking about it and setting up systems so that we're not tainted by a bad actor. Um, I, and this is why I also was very careful to say I'm not going to blame securitizations. I think securitizations in microfinance can be a way of bringing the capital markets, not just the individual or an institution, but bring the whole power of the capital markets to microfinance. And that's where you'll get to that kind of a number. Um, and I think, so I do think there's, we have had bond offerings, we've had securitizations, we've had CDOs, we've had CLOs. Financial innovation is happening in microfinance. It slowed down in the last year, but it will pick back up. Um, and there's been some interesting work. We've had a couple of funds that have closed very recently. Um, so money is still coming in. Not wham, in the sector. Microfinance, there have been some very um, successful offerings in the last, even just in this uh, year, 2009 so far. Um, the other thing that I see helping the growth is that we're moving into new ways of thinking about how to distribute credit that is not quite so loan officer dependent. Right now, the average ratio of loan officers to borrowers is about, in the industry, about 300 customers per loan officer. So that would mean I'd be going out to the 300 people over here and I'd be making the loans in groups, usually, because that's the easier way to get to the 300. Um, and that's how I'd be growing my program. People are realizing there's a real bottleneck of labor. And there are microfinance institutions that cannot hire enough loan officers to do that job, to keep to the growth. So people are looking for less loan officer heavy distribution methodologies, and they're looking at branchless banking. They're looking at using agents models, whereby you would go to your local grocer. Um, and we're all watching this to say, does that change the quality of the banking relationship in any way that's perverse to what we're trying to do? Or is it actually still advancing our mission? And I think the jury is still out on that. You mentioned early on in your presentation something about the funds drying up. Mm -hmm. Have they dried up in proportion to everything that's going on, or do no. you? So it is proportional. It's no, it's not even proportional. It's not drying up as fast as it is in other markets, and it's not even drying up evenly across the industry. Okay, so what we're finding is is that some economies are being hit harder. 
by the global financial crisis than others. Uh, some local banks are cutting their credit lines to microfinance institutions. Um, uh, as I said, we have not seen any significant depositor runs, which is a form of financing. Um, some foreign investors have slowed down, although there has evidence that there are still foreign investors interested in coming into the market. So it's hard to paint this with one brush, although we are seeing less money coming into the industry right now than we have in the recent past. And that may be okay. Again, I think slowing our growth, taking stock of where we are, is probably not unhealthy for us. However, it's really hard to stand here and make that comment when I know that there's an Indian microfinance institution, I heard about them last week, that its credit lines have dried up. And so it's got 50,000 people on a wait list for loans. This is, this is where that tension comes of access to credit and quality to credit. And, and you want to say 50,000 people waiting in line to get access to a $25, $50 loan. Um, so it is slowing. Um, we, some of us are worrying about refinancing risk in the industry. Um, I think we are different enough than the other financial actors that no one's tarring us with the same brush, but to the extent that financial systems are breaking down, we too are going to be affected. Have you noticed the slowing um, in the United States in terms of funding of these loans to go abroad? Well, that's interesting. Those online lending platforms are both US-based. And they actually got more money. Now, what I don't know. So here's a research project for any ambitious student or professor who wants to <laughs> supervise an ambitious student. What I don't know is whether or not that new money that was coming into Kiva and Microplace.com was new investors in microfinance or donors who didn't want to give their money away and would be happy to have their money be invested, but they expect to get it back. So were we cannibalizing donors who now don't feel comfortable just giving their money away and are saying, well, I'll make a loan, but I expect it's going to be repaid. So I just don't know. I don't know if that's actually new people coming in or just a shift of those who've been in the industry and are, are, are care about it. Last spring, I think, Women's World Banking uh, released a report that suggested that as microfinance was increasing, that the proportion of women served was decreasing. What, what does that mean, and is that associated with the innovation or the not serving of the poorest of the poor, or are the numbers just mm -hmm. wrong? No, it, they're not wrong. Um, and it's actually one of the few studies that it's doing a trend analysis um, that's saying, how many women were in leadership positions in microfinance in X year versus this year? One exception in that numbers, though, and I was sharing this earlier, um, the Middle East, North Africa region, there's actually been women are uh, getting more positions than they have in the past. But every other region of the world, you're absolutely correct, less women in powerful positions. And I think the answer is that as microfinance has become more commercial, and this responds to the question I answered here, which is there's a drive to get to money, to get to the scale, to meet the demand. These institutions have looked around and said, we need a more sophisticated CFO. We need a more sophisticated COO. I'm not sure our leader really understands the financial markets. And so they've said, instead of investing in the people we have now and growing their skills, which I think would be a good thing, they have said, let's go higher. Let's hire. And so they're hiring from banks. And in many emerging markets, banking is a male-dominated profession. So I think that's what's been happening. I think that's why you see the men coming in, because these institutions are commercializing. They don't see the skills in their existing staff. They're not willing to invest in them as much as they should be. And so they're hiring from the formal sector. Oh, really? I want to ask you a question.